Welcome to Walden Pod. I'm your host, Emerson Green. Today I'm speaking with John Buck and Darren, also known as Necessary Being, on libertarian free will. They're both defenders of libertarian free will, though they differ religiously. John is a theist, and Darren is not. We recorded this in my hotel room at the Capturing Christianity conference, and this was recorded shortly after the other episode you may have heard with Christian idealism and invoking theism on the problem of evil and the defeat condition. So in the uh, Phil Paper Survey, the 2020 Phil Paper Survey, 60% of philosophers are compatibilists, 20% are libertarians, 10% are free will skeptics, and 10% are just other. Like, they don't fall into any of those three categories. So the majority of philosophers are compatibilists. So they, the majority of philosophers believe in free will by a wide margin. Like, 80% of philosophers believe in free will. And the majority of philosophers are also atheists. So it's not like you have to believe in God <laughs> to believe in free will. But yeah. um, anyway, I'm just, I brought that up because I'm surprised by that breakdown. I don't know, based on the amount of airtime that free will skepticism gets, you would think that it was like the majority position among philosophers. Like, I think Stephen Fry said, like, yeah, philosophers just totally reject this idea of free will mm-hmm. at one point. But it, like that position is roughly 10%. <laughs> like yeah. 90% of philosophers do not accept that position, it, it would seem. Well, I mean, I think it's also just because the public conversation doesn't make the distinction of compatibilism or not. And so usually they have the most ridiculous or the easiestly uh, like lampoon version of free will in mind. And so, yeah, sure. Most don't believe in that. Um, whatever crazy one they have in mind. Yeah. But isn't libertarian free will the crazy thing? Whoa, let's slow down here, buddy. (laughs) Don't say things you can't take back. (laughs) What are you, I mean, how do both of you define free will? Like, um, so we can start with John. Um, You guys just heard from Darren. But John, how do you define free will? Yeah, so I think that usually if we're like just saying free will simplister, it's probably like the ability to do what one chooses. But if you want to have a more robust version of free will, I would say the libertarian notion, I would say that's the ability to have done otherwise than what you ended up doing. So that's like what I think. I think I have free will in that libertarian sense, but I also think I have it in the sort of like neutral sense, whereas probably most of the people that endorse compatibilism would say they have the free will of the first variety, but they would probably disagree that they have the ability to have done otherwise than what they ended up doing. Yeah. Like, I mean, I feel like I can do whatever I want. And I think most people feel like they can do that. So if by free will, you just mean, you know, I'm free to do whatever I choose at this moment, then that's like fully compatible with determinism. But you're like adding something onto that. I mean, it's not just adding on because like, I think I do think that I had the ability to have done otherwise. So when I like look back to my past. Oh, that's that's what I was going to say. You said could have done otherwise. The thing is, I would accept that I could have done otherwise, even if determinism were true. So, I mean, even that needs an analysis, like could have done otherwise. There's like a really straightforward sense that you mean it. Mm -hmm. And there's a slightly less straightforward sense that I mean it. Mm -hmm. But I still don't think that the way I mean could have done otherwise, you know, which is fully compatible with determinism. I don't think it's like counterintuitive or anything. I I just mean like if you're rolling a, a die, you know, it could have come up one through six, even if determinism is true. Like, it's not like that's an unnatural usage of could have done otherwise. It's like, oh, yeah, that die could have come up one, it could have come up two, it could have come up three. But, I mean, I still understand what you mean, though, where you believe in something more than that. Yeah, I think that probably maybe the the reason why I'm thinking that could have done otherwise is incompatible with determinism is just given my understanding of what the position of of determinism actually is. So I would say that determinism is the position that any state of affairs uh, was necessitated by its prior state of affairs uh, in a sort of event causal chain. And so I think that, like, whatever, if determinism were true, this particular moment must have, it was the only possible moment that could have occurred given the prior moment and alongside the past laws of nature and uh, history of events and things like that. Darren, do you think that could have done otherwise is necessary for free will? I think so. Not necessarily if it depends on if you're if you define free will as the control capacity for moral responsibility, I would say no. 
but in the way <laughs> that I uh, choose to define free will, I would say yes. Uh, so you were asking about each of our own definitions, right? Both of, both of you are libertarians, but yeah, yeah. We well, we have we have, I think we're we might be slightly diverged, but we're mostly in the same camp, right? You're both libertarians, except John is a Catholic, and you're you're roughly speaking an atheist. Yes, but I w- I wouldn't say that like my libertarian position is informed by my Catholic faith. I think I'm probably more confident that I have libertarian free will than I am confident that, I don't know, Christ established a a papacy or anything like that. (laughs) Okay, wait, so Darren, how do you uh, define free will? Okay, so I think the will is the capacity to deliberate, make decisions, and translate those decisions in action. An exercise of will is free when an agent could have done otherwise in a way that is under control of the agent, where an agent is anything that is capable of making decisions. (laughs) <laughs> Very I'm not quite sure I, not quite sure i caught all that um okay so could you explain that so i just tried to uh so uh, yeah i give kind of like a a heavy load there so it's usually this idea of, of the will is kind of like this like reified capacity this kind of experience so i broke down what the will is first so it's a capacity to deliberate make decisions and translate uh, those decisions into action. Mm. And then after that, I bring into the could have done otherwise. And I mean, and I do could have done otherwise, otherwise in a sense that was under control of the agent. Cause that, that is preempting the objection that mere indeterminism isn't enough to supply. So free will. So you need control plus indeterminism. If it's incompatible with determinism and I didn't quite catch why it's, it's, it is incompatible because like, uh, well by that definition you couldn't cause like, yeah, cause there's different analysis of ability. I think what you have in mind is like determinism where it's like maybe you went your whole life without raising your left arm. But yeah, you always had the capacity to raise your left arm like that. But also, I would say that you could make a difference in analysis between, say, uh, abilities and opportunities where it's like, yeah, it's like you do. We could list all of the abilities you have and you don't exercise a lot of your abilities um, over the course of your lifetime. But there is something about the causal structure of the world which denied you the opportunity to exercise some of those capacities. And so that's where I think the incompatibility with determinism comes in. So how would you guys, I'm not asking for a definition of free will, but I'm looking for like a phenomenology of free will. Like, what does it feel like to make a libertarianly free choice? And is it different from the phenomenology of making a free choice in a, in a deterministic universe? So I would assume both of you grant that compatibilism is like coherent, at least. So, yeah. you know, there's something it feels like to just do what you want without any constraints, you know, intentionally, voluntarily, without anyone forcing you to do it or anything like that. So that feels a certain way for an agent. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just seems like there's no phenomenological difference between compatibilist free will and between libertarian free will. Like, from the point of view of the subject, they both feel identically. Mm -hmm. I I think that's probably correct, and mainly for the version of of people who hold these different positions, who at the same time uh, feel free in whatever sense they mean this robustly. And that you have people who actually have the phenomenology of not being free at all. Um, I don't believe those people. I'm also skeptical (laughs) (laughs) to some extent. Uh, But yeah, it's like, um, I I don't, I would be skeptical of anyone who is saying, who could say that like it would definitely be different in different universes. Because I imagine with the people who feel free, we mostly feel free in a really shared sense where we're not breaking, well, like it's not, unintelligible to each other what we mean when we say we mean we're free yeah yeah so i think you're probably right that like in the experience of making a decision it probably feels the same for both the compatibilist and the incompatibilist what dan did and he talks about like you have a range of options that you're choosing from but those are just sort of like epistemic options that are available to you like you have these thoughts about the way that the world could go and then you choose one of those thoughts but it was just determined uh to be that case And I think that probably the difference might be where for the person that it seems to them that one of those options was really a live option, a way that the world could have gone. So they like hold to this sort of modal claim that it could have been the case that I chose to marry a different person or something like that. Or it could have been the case that I chose to eat at a different restaurant, something like that. Then that sort of reflection back upon the past history of the world is going to um, not going to be able to be consistent with. Uh, determinism but if indeterminism were true then it could be compatible it's just it's tough for me because every time these concepts are invoked i can't help but point out that there are multiple ways of seeing many of these concepts that everything turns on you know so it's like i get that in one sense what you just said is exactly right but in another sense, it's it's exactly wrong. Like, if you have a different analysis of could have done otherwise, like, I could have married a different person. Like, 
yes, I could have made different decisions, but if you ran it back and played it again, then the same thing would happen. But that doesn't mean that I don't just do what I want as a result of my nature and my desires and, you know, my shortcomings and like, like everything that, um, is good about me or bad about me, like my nature, the environment I'm in, like if everything is identical, then I'm going to make the same decisions. But in some sense, it still feels true to me to say that I could have married someone else in the same way that if you flip a coin, it could have come up heads or it could have come up tails. And even if determinism is true, it's not like it's crazy to say like, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the odds were 50-50, you know, before you knew it would happen. Like, um, um, that's so, why we flip coins, because right, it's, right. the odds are 50-50, even if determinism is true. It's not like if we think, oh, determinism is true, so there's no point flipping coins. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. It, like, it's still, as far as we're concerned, the odds are 50-50. It could have been otherwise. If determinism were true, and I flipped a coin and it landed heads, we would think that the way that the past history of events, plus the uh, laws of nature would entail that this always lands on heads. Now, of course, prior to actually flipping the coin, we couldn't know whether it was going to land heads or not, just because given our ignorance. So there's an epistemic sense at which the, the prior to uh, flipping the coin, we could say, yeah, it could land heads or it could land tails. But after flipping the coin, given our background knowledge of, let's say, determinism, then we're going to have to do away with this idea that the, land, the coin could have landed tails given the past history and uh it's still just i mean yes in one sense it couldn't have landed the other way Mm -hmm. but in another sense it (laughs) could have because it's a coin flip and i think for the libertarian like namely the agent causal libertarian they're wanting to really stick on to the one sense in which it the sense that matters yeah yeah yeah, exactly there you go (laughs) okay i'll I'll grant that that, (laughs) given a certain axiology it's um, <laughs> it's the it's the sense that matters yeah. but um no i i mean i grant that these two things are different I, I'm, I'm just saying powers. they're both reasonable yeah but yeah no i'm saying if you want to be a libertarian obviously you have to affirm that no you really could have done otherwise like it really could have come up heads or tails and um not just because of ignorance or something yeah. um Anyway, this is pretty huge for me, though, honestly, that you guys have both acknowledged that, like, phenomenologically, it just kind of feels the same. Whether determinism is true or whether libertarianism is true, it just, it, like, for, for, from our perspective, it would feel the same either way, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. It seems most plausible that, yeah, we have a shared experience here versus, like, having, it seems like you would need pretty good reason to think that, like, decision-making phenomenology would be very unique either, either way. Yeah, because, I mean, this is a huge hang-up for me with libertarianism, where when, when I say that I don't know what it means to have libertarian free will, you know, a lot of people say this, and I think that part of what they're saying is, yeah, they, they have a hard time grasping, like, the definition or something, but more than anything, it's hard to concretely imagine. Like, it's hard to concretely imagine what it would mean to have libertarian free will. You know, you can say, oh, well, it means that you could have done otherwise, and it's like, yeah, I, I kind of have a grip on that, but what would it be like for me to have libertarian free will, to have this, like, ability that's over and above what i think i actually have and if you're saying well phenomenologically there is no difference then that actually you know helps a lot for me actually because it seems like you're interpreting things that are like common ground so it's like it's just a difference of interpretation Mm -hmm. of stuff that we agree on yeah because i think for the compatibilists when they make a free decision quote unquote (laughs) (laughs) They have this sort of perception that, yeah, there's these options and I'm going to consider each option and then I'm going to go with the option that I think is best or something like that. And I think that for the libertarian, there's just going to be this further understanding of that picking amongst options to where the libertarian thinks that these are options that were truly open to them as an agent to pick among such that. If they had chosen one, they could have also have chosen another one, even given the same past history and laws of nature. And that would require some indeterminism in the yes. world, but it wouldn't be sufficient. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. Just some because some people bring up quantum stuff and then people will say, well, that doesn't mean that we have free will just because they're indeterminacy. And that's obviously correct. But in order to have libertarian free will, as I understand it, there has to be indeterminism just as like a, a, like a prerequisite, as like a, you know necessary but not sufficient condition for libertarian free will yeah right the way that i think of it is like somebody will say i have free will i could have done otherwise and then somebody says well no because science says that determinism is true and then that's when the proper response is to say well science doesn't actually say that (laughs) like technically there are quite a few different interpretations of quantum mechanics with that are fully open to 
uh, scientific consideration. And so I don't think the, the jury's in yet as to disproving libertarian free will via the science. Yeah. And then the next move is always just like that they say, you know, uh, yeah, the quantum mechanics, that that um, randomness doesn't really assist also the project. But, right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. They'll interpret the libertarian and sometimes the libertarian says, well, maybe my choices are made by quantum leaps and stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah. then the person will the determinist will respond. Well, if your choices are uh, produced by quantum indeterminacy, that's not you making the choice. Um, and so it's not really going to be free or up to you in any sort of sense. Right. It's it's either like not under your control because it was determined or it's not under your control because it was random. Like either way, you're not really free. You know, yeah. like that's kind of the argument. But mm-hmm. I mean, at least as a compatibilist, I'm thinking even if determinism is true, there are things that are within your control and things that aren't. And like some things are the product of you <laughs> and some mm-hmm. things are recognizably not the product of you. Mm-hmm. And all I mean by free will, and I feel like all that most people mean by free will is that you can just do what you want. Like it's a, if you have an action that's voluntary and intentional and like no one else is really making you do it. Or, I mean, there are a couple other conditions that are worth considering as well, but roughly that's like a good first approximation. And if those conditions are satisfied, then you performed that action freely. Mm -hmm. That just has nothing to do with determinism or uh, randomness. Well, I feel like also that the, so like a, like the problem with like say indeterminism is like you end up just being the space in which events unfold but and so i think the libertarian solution to that problem can also assist the compatibilists because i think they also have the same problem where like they can just be the space in which deterministic unfolds with certain voluntariness but like say uh you were to endorse uh, an agent causation compatibilist position then you get the the unique thing of being the source of your actions so you get you get robust sourcehood even though you might just not see no need for the leeway assistance in terms of making sense of freedom so uh it's it's not just for libertarian i think like the agent causation thing um can also be for you and it, and it also makes compatibilism far more plausible if like yeah you have this more ro- robust sense of sourcehood in your in your account so in order to say no i was the cause of this thing i would have to be an agent causal compatibilist i believe so okay yeah because i do want to say that so, well okay i guess unless you identify yourself with some sort of event i guess like if you take a sort of reductive account of the human self yeah as- but that's retarded <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so if i took like a, an extreme like reductionist or limitivist view of the self and said yeah. like no i'm just like a series of events right yeah then could i still claim sourcehood and as long as i say that i'm just a collection of events or something i mean you could say that but i think you're gonna you're i think you would lose out on the on it like assisting the idea. but you find it implausible yeah oh, sure that's be the better way to state it okay <laughs> I think that that position would be completely, and then it's just like a hard edit, and then it's just like (laughs) implausible. (laughs) Uh, If you don't mind, I'd like to sort of go into... Here we fucking go. My (laughs) knockdown argument for libertarian Here's your uh, implies can argument for free will. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, let's go through it. Yeah, so it's a pretty simple argument. It's just two premises and a conclusion, (laughs) if you can handle that. Sorry, I'm just laughing because Darren <laughs> was in an attempt to be more professional, started vaping under the table so as, so as to not pick up on the microphone. Hiding from Walt Emerson. <laughs> okay, well, that's an improvement upon blowing it directly into the microphone, so I'll take it. <laughs> okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a pretty simple argument. It's two premises. Uh, if I had ought to have done something, then it must have been the case that I could have done that thing. Then the second premise is there are some instances in which I ought to have done something that I did not end up doing. And then from that conclusion, uh, it entails that I could have done something other than what I ended up doing. Uh, I, I wish I had it in front of me that way I could read it properly, but you, you get this sort of picture. The first art, uh, premise is just basically defended by the ought implies can principle, which is pretty well i mean it's not like it's certainly a majority position in regards to uh philosophy of ethics but i mean there are dissenters of course i I think like a third of philosophers reject it but it is like a majority position i mean you'd think it'd be more than two-thirds who accepted it because it's such a plausible position but i I think it's the same thing as could have done otherwise they're just like well hang on what do you mean not implies can and then i mean i do kind of see where they're coming from where they think like well, obviously, you can't be blameworthy for not jumping 100 feet into the air on a building when that would have been a good thing to do for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so the plausibility of that sort of thing is then like kind of smuggled into these other cases where it's like not as clear. 
you know, so it's like ought implies can obviously holds in some cases, but that doesn't mean it's like a universal, like absolute principle or something. I would assume that's like the pushback on it. Yeah, well, I don't know. It, it just seems that like for any instance in which I can give an excuse due to the fact that I could not have done that thing, that always seems to entail that I did not have an obligation to do that thing. Because for me, it just seems quite ludicrous to sort of suggest that I have an obligation to do something that I literally cannot do. <laughs> like for you to like compel me to do that thing is just like irrational for you to like force onto me. What um, do you think of Darren? <laughs> oh, well, uh, I guess I, on the ha- other hand, think there are no uh, successful arguments for libertarian free will, but I think it's still otherwise a reasonable position to hold. Uh, that has to do with some of your like fundamental epistemic views, right? Like you think that it seems like we have libertarian free will and there are no defeaters for that seeming. So we're justified in believing that we have libertarian free will. Yeah, I want to want to go so strong as to call it like properly basic, but it's it's so constitutive of uh the way i experience anything it's um yeah i think there, you, you would need a pretty solid defeater and i think uh none has been forthcoming even though there are, there are good reasons but nothing that's like comprehensively defeating of the position but but part of your experience is like interpretive though it's not like you have like a green sense datum when you look at a tree or something like some of this is kind of whether it's conscious or unconscious you are kind of interpreting your experiences through this like libertarian free will lens, right? Sure. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that like, uh, I have any kind of like certainty in the way I interpret my own experience, but yeah, it's like, it's, it's still, it um, sounds like it's really natural for you. Like that's just how you naturally would interpret your experience. Yeah. Since I was like, a, like, you know, uh, as young as I can remember, ha- like as I have memories like that, I was thinking about this issue and did think about it that way. Yeah. Okay. So your experience is, I mean, not that you were thinking this consciously, but that there's genuine like indeterminism and in that in that space yourself like as an agent could determine what you ended up doing and what you ended up doing truly originated from yourself yes yeah definitely yeah i think that's pretty commonsensical actually even though it is kind of you know prima facie it's kind of hard to square with you know like i don't want to say scientific because it's such a loaded term but i mean like with a certain view that's like that heavily emphasizes physics and um you know says like there's nothing over and above the core theory for instance and the core theory is an exhaustive account of like the everyday world or something like that then it is kind of hard to square that with what you just said like it does just seem like well those don't naturally fit together very easily so yeah i think that's part of why it doesn't compute for a lot of people because they have this pre-existing worldview and it's like hang on what you just said like doesn't fit with what i already think you mm-hmm. know but I, not that that's uh, rational or irrational. I mean, I just think that that's, that's just descriptively a fact that, like, what you're describing is very commonsensical, but some people who are maybe more, like, scientifically inclined or something, they think that, how could this possibly fit into, like, a, a rigorously scientific worldview? Or how could, you know, what you're saying be naturalized? Or how could what you're saying be translated into some kind of physical language, you know, reductively? And I, I mean, I don't think they're wrong. I think it is kind of hard to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the, the, the challenge. I mean, like, I think part of it is sort of like they're presuming too much where, say, the like the theories that are derived from the experiments they do is like is um, ba- ranging over the uh, micro physical nature of the world and just and then assuming that 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 holds at all levels of complexity, which I think personally, you would need to do uh, experiments that are involved in macro level objects and be able to look just at the micro physical structure and be able to determine with uh, with full predictive power what the future events will be. And I don't think that has been done anything close. Right. You, I mean, so we got to go to the particle accelerator. We got to put someone's head in the particle <laughs> accelerator. Yes. And we gotta- <laughs> the main thing is shove someone's head in there first. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, before we uh, strong emergence pill people um, uh, for John's argument, so it, it starts off, ought implies can, and then it's just, well, there are some things that you did that you ought not have done. So since ought implies can, and since there are things that you've done that you shouldn't have done, or um, things that you failed to do that you should have done, then that implies that you could have done those things. Or else you have to reject ought implies can, yeah. which is or, a, which is a you, high cost. Or you could reject the idea that anybody ever does something other than what they... Uh, or had obligation to do so like so you, you could, could be, be like a moral, an anti-realist yeah exactly 
And it's funny, too, because, like, my argument doesn't even require moral realism in a strong sense. You could technically be a moral subjectivist and think that, yeah, I have these certain values, but I sometimes act against these values. And so I ought to have acted more in accordance with my values. So I act, I did something other than what I had ought to have done. Just to, like, make this uh, maybe more intuitive, like, coming at it from a different angle. So if you did something and it was physically impossible for you to avoid that thing, like, I mean, for whatever reason, you can imagine whatever scenario you want, but it was physically impossible for you to have avoided what you did. Like, if you're, I don't know, sitting in a uh, shopping cart or something, and it's careening down a hill, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's just completely out of control, and you're just, like, sitting in this shopping cart, and then someone leaps out in front of you, and they get hit with your shopping cart. I don't know. This is the weirdest example that I possibly <laughs> could have picked. <laughs> we were doing this just earlier, weren't we? <laughs> it's not like I've... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm just trying to think of something that is like unavoidable physically, like where you really couldn't have done anything about it, even if you wanted to. And then, you know, we end up blaming you. Um, I guess this is such a stupid example, because why, why are you in a shopping cart? That's careening down? <laughs> Let's say you wake up in a shopping cart as it's careening down. That's middle. what I was getting. Someone put you in a shopping cart. <laughs> yeah. You know, you ha- it's not like you and your friends were being irresponsible or something like so, uh, you know. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> if you were if something was happening that was physically impossible to avoid for whatever reason, mm-hmm. you couldn't possibly be blamed for uh failing to stop that thing. Even if it would be a good thing if you stopped the meteor from like hurtling into earth, if you can't stop it, like it's literally beyond anyone's capability to stop it. Even if it's a good thing, you can't be like, wow, you're such a bad person for, uh, you know, failing to stop that meteor or something, because right. it was just totally unavoidable. Like, you couldn't have stopped it. It was physically impossible for you to prevent that meteor from hitting Earth or something like that. So, why is that? <laughs> like, the reason that you're not a bad person for stopping the meteor is because it's totally beyond your power to stop the meteor. It's physically impossible for you to stop the meteor. If it's impossible for you to have done something, then you can't really say, it doesn't make sense to say, you ought to have done that thing. It's like, but exactly. I couldn't have done that thing. Yeah, yeah. So like, how can I be obligated to do that thing? So this has relevance for determinism because once you bring in like brain events and body events, then it's like, okay, well, if determinism is true, then it's physically impossible for me to have not done everything that I've ever done. Mm-hmm. But clearly you want to say that there are some things that um, I shouldn't have done or that yeah. I like should have done. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you put these thoughts together. I mean, like, that's what your argument is supposed to show. It's like, ought implies can. Um, You ought to have done otherwise at some point. Mm -hmm. So you could have done otherwise because ought implies can. So that's, like, basically the argument, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I I don't think it's a bad argument. I just think, like, I remember when you first presented this to me, I was like, um, it it ended up starting, like, a long, like, back and forth that went on for, like, weeks and weeks, basically. (laughs) Um, And, like, eventually what came out of it was my, like, compatibilist analysis of could have done otherwise where like i want to accept ought implies can and accept that you could have done otherwise but still reject the conclusion and say it doesn't follow basically because i have this like version of could have done otherwise that is in line with common sense and is totally compatible with determinism and um that's how i try to get out of the argument it's just (laughs) saying like libertarian free will doesn't follow from those like two premises like i want to accept those two premises Maybe you want to say free will follows from those two premises, but not like libertarian free will. But anyway, I recognize that even a lot of compatibilists want to accept that you couldn't have done otherwise. Like, you know, they wouldn't accept my view that you could have done otherwise, just in a sense that libertarians wouldn't agree with. But um, do you want to anyway. sort of elaborate what that, that view is just for the audience? It's um. so I mean, I, I have a video called Can a Determinist Believe in Free Will or something? I don't know. But yeah. I do kind of go into it a little bit where it's, it's just epistemic possibility. It's just mm. the idea that it's conceivable that you could have done otherwise. That's basically all I mean, like the analogy of a coin flip or, you know, a dice roll, like that's like a perfect analogy for what I'm talking about, where it's it's clearly conceivable that you could roll a die and it could come up a six, it could come up a five, it could, it could come up a four, but it couldn't have come up a seven. You know, so mm-hmm. I can make that distinction. Like, there are things that you couldn't have done and there are things that you could have done, and there's a range of things you could have done, regardless of determinism. So even if dice rolling determinism is true, you could have rolled a one through six. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if dice rolling determinism is true, you couldn't have rolled a seven or a 14 or a 529. So 
you still have like this robust notion of ought implies can and could have done otherwise. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, in, in my view. Right. So out of ignorance, because you don't have every single fact under well, your knowledge. It, it depends if you think that epistemic possibility and conceivability is just a matter of ignorance. I mean, is that well, it would depend upon there is something that it corresponds to in the actual world. So like an indeterminist would believe that when I believe that the coin could have flipped otherwise, could have landed on a different side of the coin, uh, that that was a legitimate possibility that might have actually taken place, then they, they have a, an accurate belief that corresponds with the way that the world can function. But for someone who believes that determinism is true, when they say that the, land, the coin could have flipped otherwise, they have an inaccurate belief. But like, given their ignorance, they're, it's understandable why they think that. I mean, I just, I feel like you, I don't want to say begging the question here, but I mean, you are kind of presupposing your analysis of could have done otherwise. And you're just saying, you're just assuming that my analysis is wrong. And you're saying, well, like, no, they're like, they couldn't have done otherwise. They're just like deluded or something. And they're wrong that they could have done otherwise. (laughs) I'm like, like, no, they're right. It could come up heads and it could come up tails. Given their ignorance. It's not some, they're not talking about the world though. They're talking about their own ignorance as to what might actually come about. But you're, you're acting like that's some kind of terrible thing, but it's the source of literally all, you know, games of chance, like all like gambling, all coin flips, all dice rolls, like so much is it's not like i invented this view of Mm -hmm. um possibility or something like this is how i feel like most people already view it anyway you know because i mean it it, i feel like this is a common sense view of could have done otherwise or could have been otherwise so let's imagine a scenario in which uh you do you perform some immoral action but prior to performing that immoral action uh, a laplazian demon basically informs you as to what all of the facts of the nature and the world are going to be so that you recognize that, oh, the only way in which the world can c- turn out to be is the one in which I perform this action. Like, do you think that you would have the epistemic ability to, ability to have done otherwise? The epistemic ability? Yeah, like... I mean, I, don't, I think it's conceivable that I could have done otherwise. Like, it's epistemically possible that I could have done otherwise in pretty much like, even most when, scenarios. Even when you're informed as to what the exact laws of nature are in past prior history of events? But as far as I'm concerned, I'm like, but I could still do that, like, if I wanted to, but I just, I'm not going to, and I don't want to. Well, I mean, it's like saying, well, you could, like, you know, take your pants off and run down the street, and it's like, yeah, I could do that. I'm <laughs> not going to, because right. I don't want to, but it's like, I st- it makes sense to me, even on my worldview, to say, you could take off your pants and run down the street, mm-hmm. and it's totally coherent to say, yes, I could do that, but I don't have the desire to do that. If I had the desire to do that, then I, I suppose I would, but um, <laughs> like I, I don't have that desire, uh, so I am not going to do it. But I can imagine like an alternative world where I do have that desire, and then I, I do that. But um, I don't know. It, it just seems like I'm not really defining terms in a funny way or anything like I, I just don't i get the feeling whenever i talk about compatibilism to determinist to like incompatibilists or libertarians <laughs> that like i'm just like making stuff up and i'm just like and it's tr- like <laughs> <laughs> they're both nodding at me right now they're both <laughs> <laughs> so i don't feel like i'm doing that i feel like i'm um staying grounded i guess um you know, in a way. And it's weird because I let you guys pressure me into feeling that way. And then I forget that the majority of philosophers actually kind of agree with me at the end of the day, well, even the if they might not agree with my specific idiots, claims. Anyway, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you <laughs> the majority of philosophers aren't even panpsychists, so I don't know why. Yeah, I exactly. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but, um, I mean, Darren, I know that you're like way more sympathetic to compatibilism than John is. So, I mean, can you explain why you don't think compatibilism is like completely crazy, even though John does for some reason that I, I can't understand? I I would say that the way you already have just articulated it is basically why I'm sympathetic to- toward it. So I think that's a reasonable position to hold. Yeah, and like and also it's like the um, I'm already like sympathetic to to semi compatibilism where if like if someone has uh, really you know you know they've been given uh, like a great like education experience say they don't they're not you know cursed with psychopathy and stuff and they really um and they go about and they do bad things and they have like a reflective understanding of what they're doing is bad and, they, and they'll still go do it it's like where, where they have all these like l- layers of what would we would call like agency and freedom there like that and we also oh plus determinism is true it's like that to me doesn't just just the mere idea of determinism 
doesn't disqualify it for me. I'm not really sure what else to say besides just like, yeah, they're like the, the compa- like the compatibilist it usually offers more interesting ideas of freedom in general because they're like they're doing they're doing most of the hard work of what's interesting in terms of like moral psychology, and then the libertarian is just like usually just adding this other thing. Plus, oh, uh, also you need the uh, ability to do it otherwise. So like, yeah, like 95 percent of it is already there on the compatibilist account. Okay, so. We covered your main argument for libertarian free will, and we, we, we touched on your main argument for it, but I did want to ask Darren, so you're an atheist who believes in free will, like roughly speaking, libertarian free sure. will, um, but something about your view that kind of surprised me that I think is different from most of the people who defend libertarian free will is that you don't think that we're using it all the time, like it's not like every single decision that we make is like a libertarianly free choice. Yeah. Um, yeah, like it, it, most of the people who I know who defend libertarian free will, it's like they make 30 libertarian choices before they have breakfast. And for you, it sounds like it's more of like a rare opportunity to get to use libertarian free will. But most of the time, we're just kind of being pushed around by our appetites and desires and like our, you know, genetics and environment. And then it's kind of this, you know, rare opportunity when we get to exercise this like special capacity that we have. I, I think that's true, but I, I want to clarify that because it depends on uh, the set. I think uh, freedom happens at a level level of like of orders. So for the most part, yeah, it's like, uh, so I think for a decision to be free uh, in the relevant sense, you there either need psychologically, there either has to be a conflict between your desires or you have to be indifferent to them. And so I think in terms of like the robust like uh, decision making that usually is discussed in the free will literature, I think that's like uh, typically on it's a little rare. I want to say it's like exceedingly rare, but it's like, you know, maybe a couple times a day. But also, um, I think like the more abstract and higher order you get, the more determined your decisions are to be. So, for example, like I'm here right now. Uh, I was determined to be here psychologically just because I felt bad for you. And so it's like, yeah, okay, I have to do your podcast, sure. <laughs> and, and then, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in this exact chair chair that's convenient. And then, but also, okay, I'm, I was determined to vape, but I don't think I was determined to vape under the table. But, yeah, so, like, <laughs> that's where, like, I had a little of my freedom. Like, that was a modification of something I was already broadly determined Truly to the, do. the dumbest use of libertarian <laughs> 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 It, 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 but but yeah, that that that's that's basically it. Is like um, and so that's what really informs a lot of my like anti-retributivism is because I don't I think it's really hard to judge how much freedom has and it's fairly restricted all the time. But like with uh, I think a lot of like especially like moral actions like that. Yeah, the broader it gets like that, the more likely it is to be uh, coming from a sense of a lack of control and impulses rather than like something you can you're just doing a slight modification of something. So do you guys have any uh, closing thoughts, you know, in defense of libertarianism, any, th- any burning uh, things that you have to uh, get out of your system to say to all the anti-libertarians in the audience right now? Yeah, I mean, you're speaking to a hostile audience almost, almost but, certainly. <laughs> uh, I'm used to it. Uh, I, I just wanted to add that, like, I don't think in order to be a libertarian, you have to, like, endorse some sort of, like, substance dualism, like Descartes or anything like that. Like, I think you could probably be, like, a full-on reductive physicalist and still be a libertarian. Just so long as you endorse some type of like indeterministic understanding of the laws of physics and things like that, which is, like I said, something that's already well within the bounds of like uh, open consideration regarding the interpretations within quantum mechanics. But like all you really require is that like let's let's imagine I am just like a brainstem or something like that, and this brainstem happens to have like intentional states, but the intentional states are non-determinative. They could. St- They could cause X or they could cause Y. And so, like, that's an instance in which me, a fully reductive physicalist being, uh, I know Emerson is, like, shaking in his chair right now because (laughs) 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 I still have free will in that instance. So I just wanted to sort of, like, lay that out there. You don't have to be a full-on woo-woo psychopath in order to be a libertarian. The combination of woo-woo and psychopath threw me off for a second, but <laughs> yeah, no, I get it, because people connect libertarianism to, like, retributive justice and, like, really mm. harsh sentences and stuff. Like, I remember ta- talking to Scott Clifton about this theoretical bullshit, and he was trying to pin all kinds of evils on, on belief in libertarian free will, and I, I just pointed out that I, I don't think that we stopped crucifying people because we, we lost our belief in libertarian free will. Like, I don't think that had anything to do with why we stopped crucifying people. 
Like, I, I don't really think that harsh retributive practices are actually due to just like a weird metaphysical belief about could have done otherwise or something. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, there's something there, obviously, but when you look at the the trajectory of I don't know how harsh things used to be. I guess like the the kinds of punishments that used to be doled out and how things have gotten sort of arguably more civilized than they were like maybe not but seemingly more civilized at least on the surface level i just don't think that that had much to do with libertarian free will like i don't think greg caruso was right about that like it just seems like completely orthogonal to any trend about um you know harshness of punishment like i don't think in sweden they are like oh no nobody over there in you know the scandinavian countries believes in libertarian free will and that's why you can have like ps5 in prison or whatever um, and then over here in America, we're all like strong believers in libertarian free will. And that's why, you know, there are so many people in like really harsh <laughs> prison conditions. It just doesn't, it seems like yeah. there's like literally nothing to do. Like one has nothing to do with the other. I guess like I'd want to just end by like trying to give what I think is like a good objection. The, the thing that really puzzles me, what puzzles me is how you make sense of, I guess, the material base to the mental so, like, a lot of times the way people try to undermine free will is, like, is showing this, like, time lag between brain events and mental events. But either way you cut it, it seems like there is some sort of priority toward, uh, toward the neurological thing, because obviously the neurological um, events are a part of it. And I think, like, the way it has to go is, be, is seeing brain events as constitutive rather than causal in terms of like that that's like just partially what our decision making consists of and that's part of why you can have the simultaneous simultaneity of that and i've heard like uh it might be analogous to the way people talk about uh the different like the relation between uh, the material and psychological elements within panpsychism when you're like looking at a brain what you're doing is you're is you're from you're from a second person perspective you're looking at what the mental thing actually consists of and i think that might be going on with decision making and so i don't know if that's actually a really good um solution to the idea of of the the relation of the, the material to the psychological but i want to say that, like i just want to say is just to make the position like vulnerable like that is like i think that's a big worry and i think that also what i suggested might be one of the better solutions to it yeah i mean i guess just for the listener i would recommend um the free will show where they had an episode i think it was called neuroscience and free will or something like that but it was like a 25 minute episode where they talked about, I think it was like four objections, maybe. This is a while ago, so I might be misremembering it. But they talked about the way that neuroscience is used to undermine libertarian free will. And, I mean, it was just, it was such good information. Like, I learned more in that 25 minutes than I have in hours of listening to, you know, neuroscience enthusiasts talk about free will. Yeah, it was just really good. It's really good demonstration of how we need philosophy and not just science, I think. Because in that, like, 25-minute episode, there was more stuff that was relevant to how neuroscience affects free will than um, like anything I've heard from Sam Harris or like anyone who's really big into neuroscience or anything like that. Thinking about the results from neuroscience and from physical science generally and just doing the physical science, those are just two different projects entirely. Um, So on that note, I think that's about it. Unless you guys have anything else you want to say before we go. We're good. It's all excellent. Let's go swimming. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you.